welcome you all to the course of microfluidics. Uh, today we will be starting with some introductory concepts related to microfluidics and uh, before entering into the topic, uh, we will be discussing about certain motivations, uh, I mean which give us the necessary impetus to study microfluidics. So, uh, but first of all we have to understand what is microfluidics and why is it important and what are its possible applications and uh, we will go forward with that. Now microfluidics is not a technical term as such, I mean it is not a scientific term, uh, I mean uh, it is sort of an interface between various subjects and uh, its interpretation depends on the manner in which you look into it. Like for example, like uh, I mean microfluidics, uh, I mean it may, I mean it may have the name micro, but in terms of its scope it is like an elephant, it, it has a gigantic scope by itself. Now if you want to say, somebody wants to say what an elephant is, now somebody who knows the tail of an elephant will say that the elephant is like a thread. So obviously, it depends on uh, how you look into it. So microfluidics being a multifaceted subject, uh, its interpretation depends on how we look into it. Now although this is an interdisciplinary course, this course is being offered as a part of our mechanical engineering curriculum. So we look into it from a particular perspective and uh, accordingly describe microfluidics like this that microfluidics is all about studying flows with characteristic length scales of the orders of microns. So uh, what is a characteristic length scale? Characteristic length scale is a length scale over which characteristic changes take place. So uh, when we say that the characteristic length scales are of the order of microns, what we essentially mean is that the characteristic changes that take place, this change these changes take place over length scales of the orders of microns. Now when we say microns, there is no great sanctity about it, it could also be nanometers. Now there is a closely related, related subject which is called as nanofluidics, a part of which we will also cover uh, as, as a part of this, this particular course. And uh, uh, when we go down to the length scale of nanometers, it is not necessary that all the physics which is occurring over micrometer scales becomes invalid. Right? Over nanometer scales also, typically beyond the critical length scale, the physics which is occurring at the mi over micrometer scales is still valid. But as you go down to length scales over which continuum considerations do not work, continuum hypothesis do not, uh, does not work and you have to treat the discreteness of the individual system. That means you have to consider the discreteness of the molecular arrangement, you have to consider the molecular entities and all those things. Then uh, uh, the paradigm shifts a little bit and uh, I mean many of the continuum considerations which we will be considering as a major part of this particular course will not be valid and then you have to go for uh, molecular understanding and molecular simulation. So a part of this course we, we will dedicate towards that, so understanding nanofluidics and uh, how to effectively address nanofluidics through molecular simulations. But we have to understand that nanofluidics does not necessarily demand molecular simulations, I mean it is not always necessary. Sometimes by stretching a little bit of uh, uh, imagination towards uh, the, uh, I mean modifying the continuum description one can uh, address many nanofluidics problems. So uh, whatever I am uh, giving uh, as uh, like the description of microfluidics is a way, is a way in which as a fluid dynamics I look into microfluidics. So obviously uh, I, will, I will show you that microfluidics is an interdisciplinary subject and uh, uh, it is not possible for an individual to know all the facets of microfluidics from all the angles and from all fundamental considerations, but uh, we will uh, briefly talk about all the facets. 
So, uh, when we say uh, characteristic dimensions of the orders of microns, I mean as engineers we should have a feel of well, I mean how I mean how thick or how thin these are. So, typical dimensions of the orders of microns are like dimensions of human hair like uh, so that is the typical thing that you talk about. So, if you have a transparent substrate on which you have a micro channel it will look like a scratch if you uh, look by a naked eye. So, uh, microfluidic devices uh, so uh, and their dimensions. So, if you look at this uh, view graph you will see that uh, I mean there are wide ranges of dimensions of microfluidic devices. So, uh, I mean uh, as I said that uh, there may not be a sort of hard and fast distinction between microfluidics and nanofluidics and uh, I mean you can think of micro nanofluidic devices even of the order of angstroms. I mean it is not that engineering has made it possible to make those devices very effectively, but we have to understand that the whole advent of the subject microfluidics had come into the picture because of the advancement in micro and nano manufacturing or micro and nano fabrication processes. Because many of the underlying scientific issues have been studied and have been uh, reasonably well understood for a long time, but engineers could not translate those understandings in, in the forms of devices until and unless there has been a significant advancement in fabrication, micro fabrication and nano fabrication. So, keeping that in spirit uh, fabrication over small scales will also be a part of this course. So, uh, we will sort of uh, uh, I mean try to see how fabrication influences fluidics and how fluidics influences fabrication. I mean these considerations uh, we will come across. Now, so uh, we can start with dimensions of the orders of angstroms to nanometers and micrometers and uh, then we can have uh, I mean sort of uh, large length scales where the micro scale physics uh, may not be that important, but we have a sort of an intermediate length scale where uh, some effects of micro scale are apparent although not very significant. Like for example, in engineering typically we talk about micro channels, nano channels, there is a terminology called as mini channel. Mini channel is sort of like it is, it is not micrometer dimension, but it is not also macroscopic channel. So, it has its characteristic features somewhat in between the microscopic and the macroscopic channel. So, these are all terminologies I am just trying to make you familiar with the terminologies, but keep in mind that these are not scientific terminologies. These are terminologies which have been coined by people to describe certain technologies. So, uh, uh, like if you are thinking of like uh, I mean how these dimensions relate to real applications like when you talk of angstroms to nanometers you think of molecular dimensions like of the orders of angstroms and then uh, nanometers to micrometers you have uh, smoke particles viruses and uh, I mean over this regime you have nano devices and the common buzzword nanotechnology is used for uh, technological applications over these length scales of nanometers uh, to microns. So, uh, little bit of larger length scales uh, I mean you, you think of uh, like other substances which, which closely relate to, to, to uh, microfluidic devices like for example, bacteria and uh, you can think of uh, substances uh, or devices uh, which are closely associated over these length scales like micro needles, micro reactors, micro filters, micro analysis systems. So, these are many terminologies which are used for microfluidic devices. Now, microfluidic devices uh, are commonly associated with certain names. For example, uh, many microfluidic systems are integrated in the form of a chip. So, uh, it is like a credit card type of uh, device on which you can have all operations of a laboratory like mixing, metering, valving, pumping all these 
fluidic operations which you normally do in a process industry, processing industry, it may be chemical processing, biological processing, all these are miniaturized in the form of a small chip. And these types of devices are called as lab on a chip or laboratory on a chip. So, the lab on a chip and many of these lab on a chip devices are used for uh, certain chemical analysis or biotechnical, biotechnological or biomedical analysis and then these have alternative names as micro total analysis systems. And uh, uh, I mean these names are so uh, popular that right for example, there is a journal called as lab on a chip or uh, you have uh, like a conference uh, named Microtas. So, uh, there are uh, I mean these names have become quite popular uh, to the community. So, and uh, just uh, to give you an idea of the uh, volume flow rates that these devices can handle. So, uh, like typically they will be uh, in the range of femtoliter to picoliter to nanoliter to microliter and uh, not uh, very commonly beyond microliter because beyond microliter you ent enter into millimeter dimensions of laying scales. So, uh, typically whenever we are talking about microfluidic devices, we are essentially talking of devices which can handle small volume flow rates or which are designed to handle uh, small volume flow rates. Now, when we say microfluidics, of course, all of you uh, have a fair idea that these days micro and nanotechnology, these are very fascinating uh, areas of research. I mean, these are very popular areas of research, not just uh, in uh, any specific country, but globally. The question is that uh, why we should go for microfluidic devices? I mean, what are the advantages that uh, these devices are going to give us. Is it totally because of fashion or uh, uh, there are scientific or technological interests in the background? So, here are some reasons why uh, we go for miniaturization. So, this is not true just for microfluidics, but for any devices where we are intended to miniaturize the product. So, the first point is one can minimize materials and sample consumption. So, uh, why we would, you can minimize the material consumption is because the device itself is small. Now, sample consumption, I will give you an example. Let us say that you want to uh, perform a blood test. So, medical diagnostics is one of the applications where uh, which we will discuss briefly now and much more elaborately as, as we proceed uh, in the course. Now, uh, if you want to test a blood sample, if you have one drop of blood, then the amount of chemical reagents that are necessary to test the sample will also be of small amount. On the other hand, if you have a large amount of blood as a sample, then you require large volume of chemicals. So, we can see that in a miniaturized system, you may require a small volume of the reagents to achieve the necessary task. Not only that, uh, because of miniaturization, one can uh, run the device with low power. So, one can re reduce the power budget. Many of these devices uh, operate fast or operate because of favorable scaling over micro and nano scales. So, we will discuss about this the different forces scale favorably as you reduce your dimensions. For example, if you reduce your dimensions, you will see that surface forces become more important. So, surface forces can help the transmission of fluid, which uh, are otherwise active, but not so important over large scale systems. So, one can use that favorable scaling, increase selectivity and sensitivity with nonlinear effects exploitation of favorable scaling laws, which I have already explained and exploitation of new effects. So, some effects which are not, when I say new, what I mean is that which are not very intuitive, which are not very intuitive over large scales, some of those effects may become important. So, 
keeping that in purview we say that miniaturization is not always a fashion many times it is essential not only that miniaturization achieves cert certain thing which is very practical it makes the device small it makes the device portable see you think of the old day computers gigantic and you think of the modern day uh, computing gadgets I mean which have become slimmer and thinner. So, you can carry them and you can work while you are travelling. So, I mean it is not always just the scientific need, but the demand from our fast changing lifestyle that has also given rise to uh, the advent of miniaturization based technology. Question is what are its applications or why is it important? We will go for applications, but first why is it important? Microfluidics is required when the application demands handling of very small volumes. As we uh, saw in the previous slide that the volumes, volume flow rates that are handled in a microfluidic device, these volume flow rates are small. Because the volume flow rates are small, you cannot use these devices for applications where large volumes are required. So, you essentially use microfluidics for those applications which require the use of small volumes like inkjet printing. In fact, inkjet printing or inkjet printers are sort of the first generation microfluidic products used in the industry. It was in early 1980s that inkjet printers were introduced in the market and in those days the subject was not known as microfluidics. I mean it evolved as a subject by itself, but uh, I mean that was one of the technological revolutions so far as microfluidics is concerned. Uh, you can use small volumes for precise drug delivery. For example, if you want to administer very small volumes, volume flow rate of drug very precisely to certain diseased cells then you can use microfluidics. Cost or performance advantages, in many cases we want to use microfluidic devices because they are less expensive and they have some advantages of performance by exploiting the signs. So, microfluidics is sort of a, uh, is located at a nice interface between science and technology. So, on one hand the objective of st studying microfluidics from an engineering point of view is to make new devices for certain applications, but these new devices have to be designed based on some fundamental scientific principles which come from the basic principles of physics, chemistry and so on. So, it is at a nice interface, uh, improved reproducibility, accuracy and reliability is what we expect that we have in microfluidic devices, although there are questions, uh, I mean or issues to be addressed if we want to ensure this. Now, uh, there are certain terminologies called as self assembly and self repair uh, and which are closely linked with many of the microfluidic systems, although those are more uh, associated with the nanotechnology than with, with, the, with the little bit larger scale systems. And uh, uh, many of the microfluidic devices like for example, if you think of uh, uh, a microfluidic device for blood extraction. So, many of the microfluidic devices they are not just functioning nicely because of the small scale effects, but they may also have minimal invasive pain. So, uh, these are uh, some of the features that uh, uh, we look for in microfluidic devices. Now, see I am teaching this microfluidics course to you, but I must confess that I am not a big expert in microfluidics, because microfluidics is interdisciplinary. So, it requires the agglomeration of so many disciplines that it, it is impossible for one individual to be an expert in the entire gamut of microfluidics. So, uh, for example, let me talk about what are the, uh, uh, what are the sort of uh, uh, specializations that are needed to address a microfluidics problem. And once you 
understand this you will uh, appreciate that any study of microfluidics is basically a team effort and how does it go on. So microfabrication, like to study microfluidics you require to fabricate micro channels or if you go down to even smaller scales fabricate nano channels. So these are jobs of fabrication or manufacturing specialists. Chemistry, over small scales surface chemistry can dictate the flow in a very interesting way. We will later on uh, address those issues and see that how does surface chemistry alter fluid dynamics. So, but for the time being just take as it is that uh, chemistry of the surface can dictate the flow in a very interesting way. So, one requires chemistry. Biology, it is not that one has to be a core biologist to work with the interface between biology and microfluidics, but most of the or many of the challenging applications in microfluidics are actually from the area of <coughs> biology. So that is why many times uh, like I have seen this experience, uh, uh, I have uh, gathered this experience that I mean when somebody, some uh, person, some professional working in microfluidics is asked that well uh, what is your uh, like specific area of application in microfluidics. He says I work in two areas, one is bio applications, another is non bio applications. That means it shows that bio applications is sort of a big thrust area of activity by itself. So it is so important that a big application area of microfluidics has emerged which we call as bio microfluidics and that also we will cover as a part of this particular course. So and uh, again the importance of the subject is such that there is a journal called bio microfluidics. So uh, uh, like bio microfluidics is a very uh, active area of research. Mechanics, like uh, I mean there are hardly engineering systems which we can think of without thinking of basic mechanics and uh, microfluidics is of no exception. So mechanics uh, is important and uh, in particular uh, we will talk about mechanics over micro and nano scales. So sometimes the classical laws of mechanics a little bit sort of uh, they have to be explained in the light of small scales not that they become totally invalid, but they have to be explained in the context of small scales and that is where mechanics becomes so attractive in small scales. Control systems, so when we say control systems what we essentially mean is that uh, like uh, just like any engineering system, if you have a mic if you have a microfluidic system which executes certain tasks, uh, I mean many of the microfluidic systems are electric electromechanical systems and a closely related area which I mean which can be thought of as a more generic area is micro electromechanical systems or MEMS. So sometimes we associate microfluidics very closely with MEMS and in fact for many of the MEMS applications microfluidics appears to be a building block. So in many of these systems you have to design a very nice control system for the system to operate efficiently and control systems become critical. Microscale physics and thermal fluidic transport I mean that is where we will mainly focus on uh, in, in this particular course. So, uh, by microscale physics what we mean is that like uh, the classical uh, mechanics of fluids that we study commonly, uh, I mean many times uh, I mean it is not that all those equations that you have learnt in your basic fluid mechanics will be invalid, but uh, those equations sometimes do not take into consideration certain features which are not important at large scales, but as you scale down your system those features are important and those features have to be taken care of. Numerical modeling, numerical modeling is a very important area or, or a very important aspect of microfluidics. Now when we say numerical modeling, uh, we have to keep in mind 
that uh, numeric it is still a numerical modeling of fluid flow problems. So, uh, broadly in the purview of CFD, but not always traditional CFD, because the traditional CFD you can use when the continuum considerations are valid. So, uh, that traditional CFD considerations are used for many microfluidic applications with certain modifications may be in the boundary conditions and uh, sometimes in the description of the effective properties of the fluid and so on. On the other hand, when continuum considerations are not valid, then one has to go for molecular simulations. So, molecular simulations uh, I mean either explicit uh, execution of the dynamics over molecular scales that means uh, directly capturing the dynamics of individual molecules which is called as molecular dynamics or some statistically averaged considerations over simulated molecules and like these are called as Monte Carlo simulations for example. So, on one side you have molecular level simulations, on another side you have continuum simulations, but there are some simulation paradigms which sort of act as a bridge between these two like which are neither fully of continuum nature or they are apparently of continuum nature, but they incorporate certain molecular considerations not by explicitly capturing the molecules, but implicitly. And on the other hand you have the explicit capturing of molecules. The in between paradigm is called as mesoscopic simulation. It is neither the continuum scale nor the molecular scale something in between which is called as mesoscopic simulation and uh, one of the very well known mesoscopic simulation techniques is the lattice Boltzmann method. So, uh, there are issues of numerical modeling and in microfluidics there are uh, research groups working solely dedicated towards numerical modeling. Material science, now uh, I mean can you think of an engineering system without due consideration of materials? It is impossible because like in a microfluidic device the surface effects have a strong role to play and the surface effects are in many cases dictated by the material property of the surface. So, you can engineer the surface properties by designing the materials. So, and that you can choose a particular material for some functionality, you can create the gradient of the functionality. For example, you can make a sub make a surface with a weightability gradient. So, instead of a constant weightability, you can make a weightability gradient surface and that weightability gradient surface can use very low energy to achieve certain fluidic operations. So, it is, po it is possible to uh, like achieve magical feats by playing with the surface and when we try to achieve that the material plays a very important and deciding role. System integration and packaging. So, system integration and packaging when we say what we essentially mean is that like essentially if you want to make a usable microfluidic product, it like if you want to translate it from the laboratory scale to a usable scale maybe a commercial scale. So, you have to uh, package the product in a in a proper way and that and this pack by this I mean this packaging has also scientific issues by this packaging I do not mean a business uh, oriented outlook towards packaging that is a part of that, but one needs to take care of many scientific issues as well for the packaging and system integration. Validation and experimentation, so just like the numerical modeling is important it is imp so, but uh, by simulations whatever design parameters we get. Now, whether those design parameters are good for operating a particular device, how do you know? So, for that you have to validate and do experiments. So, validation and experiment, reliability engineering. So, I, mean, I have not listed many more uh, disciplines, but just to make you feel understand, make you understand, make you feel that uh, microfluidics uh, is 
not just a subject of say maybe mechanical engineering, chemical engineering, biology, chemistry like that or physics. So, it is a subject where all aspects of science and engineering uh, they merge together to work on certain applications. So, it is very it is it is not possible for an individual to be experts in all these. So, now what should be the outlook? See I can share my personal outlook with you that how I perceive microfluidics research. See uh, it is very important that you may not know all aspects of microfluidics in depth, but you should try to develop a working knowledge to interface with experts of those. But you should yourself be a domain expert in at least one of the areas. That means at least in one of these facets you should be the last word. So, it, it should not be an approach that by being a microfluidics engineer we want we intend to be jack of all trades, but master of none that should not be the spirit. So, we should be at least master of one particular aspect of microfluidics and for other aspects we should have a working knowledge to interface with the experts and that is how our teamwork in, in microfluidics develops. Now, what are the applications of microfluidics? So, we have uh, already discussed that what are the aspects that need to be taken care of for microfluidics applications. So, uh, using uh, if, if all those features are there in a device, then uh, there are very special applications that we talk about mixing and reactive system analysis. So, why mixing is important in micro scale? So, let me just give you a perspective. So, you know that when you think of classical fluid mechanics, when you think of mixing, the first concept that comes to your mind is turbulent flows. Because turbulent flows because of enhanced diffusive transport have good mixing. Now, in microfluidics, typically because of the small length scale, the Reynolds number is small and at low Reynolds number, turbulence effects cannot be realized. So, you have to design the device by clever means to achieve mixing without necessarily having turbulence. So, that is a big challenge by itself and, uh, but why is mixing important? You may always ask that why should we uh, have enhanced mixing? Now, to have rapid reaction, if you have say two reactants, these reactants must first mix before they react. And so, if you want to achieve rapid reaction, you need to achieve rapid mixing as well. So, to enhance the rapidity of a process, of a chemical process may be, it is important that you have also rapid mixing. So, mixing is a big problem in microfluidics. Fundamental understanding of biophysical processes. Fundamental understanding of biophysical processes like uh, uh, for example, I will talk about this in details, but uh, just to create a perspective that in <coughs> human body there are cells and uh, cells are there in blood vessels of various dimensions. So, blood vessels like there is a hierarchy of blood vessels and this hierarchical length scale variation is very interesting. You have large arteries well, which are which are macroscopic scale features, large veins, small arteries, small veins, then arterioles, venules and micro capillaries. Micro capillaries in human body are micro channels. So, now it is it is a I mean there are many outstanding questions. I will talk about one outstanding question that uh, when a cancer cell is traveling through the this uh, circulatory system, right, it, there is a stage of cancer where a cancer cell from its origin moves to a distant location within the human body by the blood stream and creates a new cancerous growth at a new location. This process is known as metastasis and it is a very uh, critical stage in cancer progression and uh, during that stage the cancer cell has to also pass through micro capillaries. 
and because of the extremely stressful condition, it is very difficult for a normal cell to survive under those conditions, but a cancer cell can survive. We will try to address this question later on and see that how microfluidics can solve this problem. But you can understand that biophysics of cancer progression or hemodynamics, the dynamics of blood in small capillaries in a human body. So all these things are related to fundamental understanding of biophysical processes and these are critical. Now why we say these are critical? Because these are not straightforward extensions of the traditional understanding of fluid mechanics. Let me talk about a very simple, apparently or elusively simple problem like flow of blood through arteries and veins or even flow of blood through micro capillaries. Now when we think of its analogy with a large scale engineering system, it is like its closest analogy is flow of water through pipes which we study normally in fluid mechanics in the undergraduate fluid mechanics course. Now if I ask you that what is the difference between that and flow of blood through a blood vessel, right, you will have certain ready answers. What are those answers? Like for example, like you may say that blood is a much more complex fluid than water. I mean blood may have non-Newtonian characteristics over certain regime and it may hold Newtonian characteristics over some other regime and uh, the effective or apparent viscosity of blood uh, varies in a very complicated way with the uh, blood chemistry like blood composition and so on. So blood is not a very simple fluid. Having appreciated that, it is not that the blood, the rheological aspects of blood remain a mystery. It is not like that. Rheological aspects of blood have been reasonably well studied and extensively understood by people. So one can borrow that understanding for studying the flow of blood through blood vessels. The, there are in fact other more subtle uh, complications. The second point about this flow of blood through blood vessels is that the blood vessels are flexible. Unlike the standard rigid pipes, these are flexible. But mathematicians may argue, okay, okay it is fine, let it be flexible, let us assume the radius of the blood vessel R equal to R0 plus R1 cos omega t plus R2 sin omega t, whatever, some nice Fourier series may be. But you know, in reality, the blood vessel, the local diameter of the blood vessel varies in a very complicated way with the local blood pressure. And it is not universal. That is the difference between the mechanical world and the biological world. In the mechanical world, when we say that this is the material, it will behave in this way, the same material will behave in that way provided the other conditions are the same. But human beings, the system is very complex. Like you will have a certain uh, like variation of your blood pressure based on certain emotional conditions which are not sort of mimicked in the same way by some of your other friend. So you do not have a universal rule of how the diameter of the blood vessel varies with local blood pressure. It, it is so much individualistic that it is very difficult to bring in, bring it in the context of a fundamental mathematical model. So you see that an apparently simple problem in, in the living systems gives rise to such a complex understanding which is yet an unsolved problem. So fundamental understanding of biophysical processes. Manipulation and analysis of biological macromolecules like DNA, RNA, I mean these are important and I will show you that uh, later on we will discuss that how these are related to biotechnological applications that is handling of DNA, RNA handling of cells, handling of proteins and all these. Biomedical diagnostics, biomedical diagnostics is a big area and uh, biomedical diagnostics, I mean I will discuss about this in more details that what are the 
demands of biomedical diagnostics which are more ap more aptly addressed by microfluidics than the traditional techniques that why microfluidics is so important for biomedical diagnostics drug delivery blood extraction i mean these are all related to medical applications so biomedical diagnostics drug delivery blood extraction all together there is a whole bunch of applications of microfluidics in medical sciences and uh, because it is mainly an engineering interface with medical sciences these days it is given a terminology called as healthcare engineering so microfluidics is a sort of an essential element of healthcare engineering now non uh, biological applications there are several applications like the inkjet printing i have already discussed with you that uh, why inkjet printing uh, is important and uh, i mean uh, important as a microfluidic device because it is traditionally like one of the very early microfluidic devices uh, that was introduced electronic schooling so electronic schooling is again another area see where if you want to have a miniaturized chip which because of uh, heating the it is trying to fail in terms of its thermal design then it has to be cooled now that cooling has to be done by a system which is matching in terms of miniaturization with the small device itself so if you have a small device you cannot have really a large fan to cool a small device i mean you may have of course but that will kill the purpose of miniaturization so you require microfluidic systems to cool electronic uh, devices and systems and uh, electronic schooling or uh, uh, like a more scientific terminology that is associated with this field is called as thermal management of electronic device and devices and systems now we have uh, uh, learned about uh, the microfluidics uh, uh, i mean its fundamental uh, inception and uh, i mean what are the disciplines involved in studying microfluidics the uh, uh, some basic motivation in studying microfluidics and uh, of course uh, some applications now we will uh, sort of uh, uh, get into it further by noting the fundamental flow physics how are microfluidics different from of uh, microfluidic devices different from macro flows this is important because all of you have a particular perception about fluid mechanics because of your exposure to the classical subject of fluid mechanics now if all those issues can directly be used in microfluidics there would perhaps not be a separate need of introducing another subject so one has to prepare this little bit of a scientific motivation that uh, in terms of flow physics how things are different as the length scale becomes smaller surface effects tend to dominate why the reason is that uh, as you reduce the length scale the surface area by volume ratio increases let me give you an example i mean uh, not typically related to microfluidic device but let us say that you have a sphere of radius r okay so if you have a sphere of radius r then what is its volume 4 by 3 pi r cube and what is its surface area 4 pi r square so area by volume is proportional to r square by r cube that is 1 by r so as you reduce r as you reduce r the area by volume ratio increases right so this is a typical example of course uh, there are hardly microfluidic devices which are spherical so i don't want to mean 
that you borrow the understanding exactly on the phase value, but just to give you the concept, the, if you take R as a length scale, if you make the length scale smaller and smaller, then area by volume ratio of the geometrical feature increases. So, when the area by volume ratio increases, what essentially uh, happens is that uh, whatever forces are important over surface, that forces become more prominent. So, that means inertia forces may turn out to be negligible in comparison to electrostatic, electrodynamic, viscous or capillary effects. That does not mean that inertia forces are important for all microfluidics problems. Please do not keep this prejudice in mind. There are many microfluidic devices which operate with important inertial effects and th that particular aspect of microfluidics is known as inertial microfluidics. So, uh, because it, it covers certain special problems, other than those special problems, the more common problems are associated with negligible inertial effects as compared to other effects. Next point, layering of fluid atoms parallel to the atomic layers adhering the solid boundary may give rise to strong density, local density fluctuations. So, when we say density, we do not mean density as a continuum property, it is the local number density of molecules. So, the local number density of molecules near the wall, there is a structure that the molecules uh, assume. Now, these structures occur over length scales which are small, but if the device length scale itself is comparable with that length scale, then the near wall variations in density or the near wall di density distribution may have a strong role to play. So, in one in some case, there may be less density of liquid in the near wall region and then uh, that kind of uh, situation is typically encountered for hydrophobic surfaces, that is surfaces which have phobia for water, for example. That is what, uh, I mean, is the literal meaning of hydrophobic. So, on the other hand, you can have surfaces where there is a strong local distribution of liquid. So, these density distribution differences may alter the local fluid dynamics. So, they might uh, essentially invoke certain uh, like sort of non-intuitive boundary conditions like slip boundary condition instead of no slip. Now, the slip may also occur, we will discuss about this in details, but just to summarize, uh, I mean just to give you some initial thoughts, slip may occur when liquid molecules are sheared very vigorously. So, that means, uh, so liquid molecules let us say they are uh, attached to a solid boundary. Now, with a very high shear rate, it is possible to dislodge them from the attraction of the solid boundary. So, how, how is that shear rate possible? That shear rate is so high that normally that will not occur but in devices approaching molecular length scales it may be possible because the shear rate is what? So, think of a quet flow, you have flow between two parallel plates, the shear rate like the out of the two parallel plates one plate is moving at a velocity relative to the other. If that relative velocity is u like uh, let me draw a schematic to explain this. So, you have two parallel plates let us say this plate is moving with a velocity u relative to the bottom plate and the gap is h. So, the shear rate is related to u by h. Okay. So, at a very high shear rate, the liquid molecules may be dislodged. So, high shear rate will require a very small value of h. So, for normal Normally, engineered channels that may not that kind of high shear rate may not take place, but in channels which approach molecular dimensions that may take place and then you can have a literal dislodging of molecules, liquid molecules from the solid boundary. This kind of slip behavior 
is more common for gases uh, because of a relatively weak molecular compactness. For liquids, it is very difficult to dislodge the liquid from its surroundings because of a strong level of attraction, but because the liquid is a relatively dense system. For gases, the intermolecular attraction is relatively weak, so it is possible, it is more easily possible to dislodge the gases and slip in, slip in, in gas flows is uh, not a very uncommon thing over micro and nanoscale. So, we will discuss more about this, just I am trying to give you some preview of, I mean what are the interesting scientific features. Different diffusion characteristics near the wall in comparison to that of the bulk may give rise to anomalous diffusion. So, normally when we solve a problem, we use a problem of mass transfer, we use a diffusion coefficient. Now, that diffusion coefficient many times we use a common value for both the bulk and the near wall regime, but the near wall behavior may be different from that of the bulk in a small scale system where surface effects are very important. So, one has to think of a different aspect of diffusion as we uh, go from the surface to the bulk. Surface characteristics of the device strongly influence the flow behavior. This is a quite intuitive and it follows from the argument that in a microfluidic device the area by volume ratio is large, therefore surface effects are important. So, surface characteristics like surface charge, surface weightability, these strongly influence the flow behavior. So, that is where like for example, if surface charge is important, then you have to consider the electrical aspects. So, the physics of the charge dynamics or the charge distribution close to the wall will affect the fluid flow. So, these types of problems are called as multi physics problems. So, where the physics of fluid flow is not just plain and simple fluid dynamics, but it is related to electrostatics, electrodynamics and so on. So, in many of the microfluidics problems, you essentially have to address multi scale multi physics and also physics over multiple scales. That is a length scale which is very close to the wall and the system length scale which dictates the bulk behavior. So, multiple length scales or multiple physical scales and multiple physical features. So, these are called as multi scale multi physics problems and many of the microfluidics problems are like that. Rheology of the fluid may be very significant for flow manipulation and control. So, uh, uh, the constitutive behavior of the fluid that is the stress versus strain rate relationship may be very significant and uh, the manner in which the fluid behaves close to the wall may be different from that in the bulk as I already mentioned and the rheological aspects may interface with that and by that you can manipulate the flow in a very interesting way. Surface roughness being comparable to the system length scale is likely to play a very critical role. This is something which is very important even for laminar flows. The classical fluid mechanics says that for fully developed laminar flow, the product of friction factor and Reynolds number is a constant which is independent of the surface roughness, just is dependent on the geometry of the cross section of the channel. So, uh, this is the classical fluid mechanics understanding. Now, these understandings assume that the surface roughness length scales are not comparable to the system length scales, but in microfluidics, in many of the micro channels and nanofluidic channels, you may have the surface roughness elements comparable to the characteristic system length scales and then these may influence the flow non trivially. We will discuss about this and all these aspects taken into account mean that micro floats are often characterized by multi physics and multi scale features which I have already discussed. So, we have discussed some aspects of micro fluidics and uh, uh, I mean how these are different from macro scale flows and what could be the possible applications, what are the, what are the challenges and so on 
and uh, the way in which we will proceed further is like this that uh, like uh, we have to think of that what microfluidics can do by stretching our imaginations before getting into the mathematical description of the subject. So, uh, I mean we will of course, I mean after one or two more lectures move on to the mathematical description of microfluidics which we will build up from classical fluid mechanics. I am not assuming that all of you have sufficient background of classical fluid mechanics because I understand that many of you come from diverse backgrounds and it is an interdisciplinary course. So, I am not presuming that everybody has undergone a standard course of undergraduate fluid mechanics. So, we will start with some basic considerations that lead towards the foundation of fluid mechanics and then more specialized towards microfluidics. But before that, we will talk about by stretching our imaginations that what marvels we can do with microfluidics. So, in the next lecture, we will be talking about some interesting research findings related to microfluidics, mostly from my own research group, but also from the research activities of others as reported in the research literature world, worldwide. This is just to give you a feel that if you learn the basics of microfluidics, what are the cutting edge problems that you might be in a position to solve. Anyway, let us stop here today. Thank you very much.